So welcome. Good afternoon, but also good evening and good morning to many of us. Um, it's really our pleasure to be back uh, at ITM uh, with our alumni webinars after our summer break. Um, and uh, it's good to welcome you to the eighth alumni uh, webinar focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on the vulnerabilities of asylum seekers, refugees and undocumented migrants in South Africa. Um, in the ITM alumni uh, webinars on COVID-19, ITM alumni present their impressions on the current situation of COVID-19 in their country. The main aim of the series of webinars is to share experiences, expertise and insights within the ITM community of alumni, students, staff, partner institutions and the wider global health community. So um, today we have, um, we have the pleasure to announce the moderator who is um, a doctor, doctoral researcher Nandini Sarkar. She works at, uh, at ITM. Um, she is a doctoral health system researcher with a background in health psychology and global mental health. Based at Antwerp, her work focuses on using community-based qualitative and mixed methods approaches in exploring complex health problems. So Nandini, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I have the pleasure of moderating this session, um, which is uh, being done by essentially a good friend of mine. Uh, let me please introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Ferdinand Mukumbang. Uh, Dr. Ferdinand Mukumbang, or Ferdi, as we like to call him, is a health policy and systems researcher. Um, and he's currently working as a senior scientist in the Burden of Diseases Unit in the South African uh, Medical Research Council. Um, I already noticed that we have one uh, question in our Q&A, which is, will you give a soundtrack link at the end so far? Very nice. I'd already like to give a shout out that this, um, the music that you heard at the beginning was already um, organized by Ferdi himself. Um, so hopefully Ferdi can answer that at the end of his presentation. Let's dive right into the presentation. Um, I think it's about 20 minutes. Um, and we'll take the Q&A um, questions thereafter. Please feel free to be interactive in the Q&A box, drop as many questions as you can, and we will do our very best to answer as many of them as we can. Thank you very much. Ferdi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining um, this um, uh, webinar that we're going to be discussing about how COVID-19 has um, impacted and increase the vulnerabilities of asylum seekers, um, um, undocumented migrants in South Africa. I want to thank everybody for joining. I know that we all have a lot of meetings to attend and things to do. And so I really appreciate you um, affording us your time to be able to attend. We're going to have a, um, a great time and I would really welcome a lot of questions. And uh, of course, I would not really have all the answers to them, but we can all reflect together and see how we can move forward. So I'm going to start the presentation and the presentation is estimated to take about 20 minutes. And after that, then we will have questions and discussions after that. Okay, so basically, um, uh, South Africa is one of the economic hubs in, in the African continent. We, we know that. And I think um, it's one of the middle income countries in, South, um, in Africa and really has a better economy compared to the countries around it and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Because of this context, it attracts a lot of foreign nationals, whether they are um, um, fleeing away from war situations or for economic reasons or for whatever reasons, just for better well-being and living situations, South Africa attracts a huge number of people from the African continent continent and also from the world. And so officially, um, based on the latest um, uh, figures, um, it is estimated that there are about 2 million foreign born migrants living in South Africa. But um, uh, that is just the official figure because a lot of people living in South Africa that falls within the ambit of this group do not have documentation. And so unofficially, it is estimated that there are about four to 5 million um, migrants living in South Africa. So whatever the situation or whatever brings um, um, these people to the country, we, I, I believe that they all, are, they all find themselves in similar situations. They all find themselves 
in conditions that um, we that that we describe as the vul existing vulnerabilities of of refugees or asylum seekers or foreign migrants or whatever category that they find themselves. I, I believe in South Africa that they find themselves within the ambit of these um, similar um, contexts. And so this is a framework that was developed um, to capture um, the vulnerabilities of these groups. And so we have, um, first of all, the protection crisis, which relates to having access to asylum, especially for those fleeing war conditions from their country. And so for those who came based on economic reason, we will have detention and forced removal. Those who just came unofficially in the country, especially um, Zimbabweans who come in just by jumping over the fence, and then they just find themselves in the country if you are caught then they have to detain and probably deport you um, back to the country. And then obviously you also have a lot of stranded migrants who do not have any documentation and then there is war in their country. They are neither here nor there. And so those are some of the um, protection crises that, that, that they're faced with at this point. And then which also trickles down now to their health crisis and their health crisis now is based on unsanitary and crowded living conditions because they are stranded, because they don't know where to go. They don't have a place to stay. And so this compromises their health access and their access to healthcare, especially when you are required to present an official documentation to be able to access healthcare and services, then that becomes a problem because you are undocumented um, and most of the people or foreign nationals in this country are. And food insecurity because you do not have the proper documentation, you cannot also get, get a job or even something to do. And so that also trickles down to your um, socioeconomic crisis, which is the rising unemployment in this group, no documentation, no job. Job. and then loss of livelihood, of course, and then declining remit remittance. You cannot send anything back to your country or to the people back home that, 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 that they knew when you were leaving that you're going for greener pastures. And then when you get here, the pastures are not actually greener than, than the situation that you left behind. And so what I'm going to do in this um, webinar is that I'm going to, dis dis um, I'm going to cut the talk into two different phases. In the first phase, to make it easier for our own understanding, I'm going to shed light on the vulnerabilities of these group of people before the COVID-19 pandemic. Because what I was trying to illustrate in this webinar is how the COVID-19 pandemic has deepened their situation, has exacerbated the conditions under which they work. And so to understand to what extent um, the COVID-19 has exacerbated their conditions, we have to first of all reflect on how the conditions were prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the first phase is going to be dealing with that. And then the second phase, obviously, we'll be looking at their situation after the pandemic hit the country, and especially coming through the lockdown, um, uh, the lockdown commands that was received from that, that, that the government sent through. So let's start. And then again, I'm going to focus on the framework to guide the discussion. And so in the first bit, I'm going to be looking at the protection crisis. So the protection crisis, like the situation prior to the COVID-19 regards to the protection, which I've just talked about. So the biggest issue that has plagued South Africa in terms of their relationship with other African countries is the phenomenon of xenophobia. I am sure that each and everyone here listening to me have gotten a hint of the xenophobic tendencies that South Africa has. And it is really widespread and can be very lethal. And sometimes it really, really gets the whole world irky because sometimes these foreign born migrants are being killed. Sometimes they are, their houses are being burned, their shops are being destroyed, their livelihoods are being destroyed by the, um, by the PM, by the South African citizens. And the newspaper always carries it. This is Al Jazeera that was reporting on it. And the, the title is, There Will Be Blood Xenophobia in South Africa. And the title really captures this because it is always routine and lethal. That like you do not, if just one little thing can trigger xenophobic attacks here in South Africa. The, the, the latest one is there was, a, there was a, a little girl who was who was murdered and then they went and found 
the, they, they went and found that the murder the, the murderer was living even though was was a South African born a South African citizen but was living in the house owned by a foreign national because of that the house of that foreign national was burnt down so and they they said that he was harboring a murderer when he was not even aware of the deeds of that guy until in uh, until the investigations took place so it's quite easy for this flare-ups to really come up and you will also see situations like widespread xenophobia in south africa they can be situations like what you see in the photos and that's why they usually say it is lethal in this situation you just see this man being battered in other situations they are actually being put they're actually being burned using tires just because you are a foreign national. And the reason for this, these xenophobic, xenophobic flare-ups is that foreigners are usually the scapegoat. So whatever the government fails to deliver economically or otherwise, the foreigners are being blamed for it. They say that the foreigners are stealing their jobs. This is the main reason why foreigners are being beaten or killed or, or the whole essence of the xenophobic attack that foreigners are stealing their jobs, their women, they are depleting the basic necessities or basic services of the country. They are spreading disease and they are running crime syndicates. These are usually the reasons why that, that the population give for these xenophobic attacks. And whereas South Africa, these foreign nationals, they are only 5 million out of, of 55 to 60 million people living in South Africa. But these 5 million people are blamed for everything that is going wrong in South Africa. And so because of this physical xenophobic attack um, that happened, there was a huge retaliation. So other African countries started retaliating to South Africa. So for example, um, the embassy, the, the South African embassy in, in Nigeria was actually burnt down. We, um, any company like MTN Mobile Telephonic Workshop that is owned by South Africa, that is in Nigeria and in other African countries are being attacked. They are being asked to shut down, shop right, um, um, Morton. So because of these, um, this, this backlash and the other countries retaliating, the South African government decided now that this, decided to halt this xenophobic attack and promised their population that they would handle xenophobia in another way. And this came out rather through now different, different rules. So for example, you see the statement, new refugee laws undermine human rights. So you would see now situations where the government is now forced to put out laws there against um, uh, foreign nationals that undermine um, um, the, um, the, 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 the human rights, just because they want to, to an extent, um, eliminate or avoid or reduce the physical violence that we see occurring in South Africa. And based on that, you now see things like these refugees have decided to go on mass exodus out of South Africa because they feel that the pressure, not only from the population amongst whom they live, but that the government is not helping. The government is actually increasing this pressure through very tight rules um, um, and laws that are being passed. And so quite recently, um, towards the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, before the, um, the COVID-19 um, um, pandemic hit, we had um, foreign nationals demanding, they went to the International Organization for Migrants demanding that they should be removed out of Af South Africa and taken to another, wh whatever other country where they can stay in a better situation. So also another aspect of, of protection crisis that these people face is regard to corruption. Corruption in the home affairs or in the refugee reception camps is appalling. You get you get situations where you are requested, even though you do not need to pay any money to get um, refugees um, a, a refugees documentation, even just to seek asylum. But then you get people being asked to pay huge amount of money for you to get an asylum documentation, 
And so because of this, people, they don't have jobs in the first place. So how would they even afford the fee to pay for the asylum documentation? And so they just decide to gallivant the country without any documentation. And so they remain undocumented. And because of this, they cannot have any healthcare services. They cannot have access to healthcare services. They cannot have employment. They cannot have anything because they are undocumented because first, they need money to be able to access asylum documentation. And even at the, deport at the deportation centers, even if you are being picked up and then you are being, um, being deported for not having the documentation, if there is somebody who can come up with some sum of money to bribe your way in terms of remaining in the country, that is always a possibility. So even they have just one um, deportation center, it's called the Lindela Deportation Center, and it's for those who do not have money. The headlines speak for themselves. So those who are deported are those who do not have money. And so these are the challenges that, the structural challenges that refugees are having in terms of their protection. And so you see, um, um, even investigations have led people to understand that the, 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 this broken home affairs system leaves um, um, these refugees stranded because I do not have the money to access um, um, asylum documents, but yet I am, I am supposed to stay within the country. I cannot travel, I cannot travel out of the country. And so they're stranded, they're neither here nor there. So they don't, they, they now just um, essentially become beggars, like you can see um, um, in, in this headline and then everywhere. And then the situation became so bad that the churches started to pick these people up from, um, from the streets just to give them some sort of um, humanitarian services, some sort of place to stay, some, some food, even if it's just breakfast. Um, now um, we've um, I've, uh, finished with the protection crisis, let's move on to the, to, to the healthcare crisis. And of course, it's linked directly, as you can see in the arrow, to the protection crisis. And so you would see, based off that, having no place to stay. These are the images that you see walking in the main, this photo was taken in the CBD of Cape Town. Like this is at the center of the city of Cape Town. These are the images that you will find. This is how, this is the condition under which these foreign nationals are leaving. And so that's why they now started asking that we have to leave this country. These are the conditions. This is South Africa's failure of humanity these are the conditions. And this is right at the center of the, of, of the city of Cape Town. These are the images, the conditions are just appalling under which they live. And so, but the, 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 the National Health Act says that South Africans or, or, or migrants in general, all of them in the box, they have access to healthcare, free healthcare. They should be able to access healthcare. The Refugee Act also says, yeah, we will give them free healthcare if they need it. They have right to access our primary healthcare system. The Department of Health Secular also states the same. However, the Immigrant Act differs from the three first um, different um, acts. It says that the, it, 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 the law are clear on refugees and migrants' rights to access care. The Immigrant Act is different in that the staff at the clinic and hospital must find out the legal status of patients before providing care. That now becomes a huge problem. And so even though the National, um, the National Health Act, the Refugees Act and the Department of Health Secular says that every person living within the boundaries of South Africa has should or must have access to the same basic healthcare services as South African citizens, but the Immigration Act now requests the health workers to ask for a legal documentation for care to be provided. And so now with these people moving around undocumented because the home office is corrupt, because they don't have the money to be able to pay and get this documentation, then they do not have access to care, even the most basic care. And so, um, and even you even have publications that are even reflecting what um, the situation of the last of the last act, which says, "Don't send your sick here." This is a healthcare provider saying, "Don't send your sick here to be treated. Our own people need it more." 
migrants access to healthcare in South Africa. So that is the picture and that is the situation in terms of healthcare that asylum seekers are really faced with. And so the authors found, found that asylum seekers and refugees are entitled to emergency hospital care, but then because the healthcare providers, because they remain undocumented, most of them, because they lack papers, they cannot actually access this care. So after that, now we also go to food security, which is definitely related to the health. And all the people have done research and have found, have, 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 have found that, excuse me, that there is a serious household food problems with, with food security, because obviously they do not have jobs. For them to get this job, they need um, documentation. For them to get the documentation, there is huge corruption at the home affairs. So the circle, as you've seen in the framework, really reflects the conditions of what's going on with the South African population. And so with the socioeconomic crisis that we're having, we're having huge and rising unemployment. This is your economic challenges facing the integration of foreign nationals in South Africa. The, it's always related back to the xenophobic attack. We see this all the time. They cannot get jobs. And so this is sometimes the reason why they will turn, they will turn towards crime. They will turn towards mugging people um, because they need to do these kind of things to be able to sustain their lives. So we see here in this, um, 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 this author reflected that um, refugees in South Africa continue to face targeted exclusion. So even the laws in the country, the new laws now really target South African and uh, non-South Africans and tries to exclude them from any lucrative conditions anything that would be, would be economically beneficial, first, the South Africans should be prioritized. And so this now makes it difficult for foreign nationals to thrive and even just to survive within the context of South Africa. And so you even see illegal, um, um, illegally employed foreigners arrested in Cape Town. So even if you try to do um, an employment through the back door, or if you don't consider um, their documentation or their documentation status, because I think that there are some companies um, who, who try to do that so that they don't have to pay a lot of taxes and also they don't have to pay a lot of money for this to, to these people because it's, I don't know, the on the table kind of payment, you don't have to go through the, um, the whole systems. And so to do that, you can employ even foreigners who do not have documentation. And so even so, there are still investigations, these companies are investigated. And when they are found out of employing um, uh, foreign nationals who are not documented, they are, they, they are being raided and arrested. And obviously the next step would be the de um, deportation. So that first phase now has just in, in, encapsulate the situation of, um, of, 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 of the participants of um, asylum seekers and refugees and undocumented migrants in South Africa. The second part, which I'm going to be entering into right now, will be now when COVID-19 came on board. So um, as we're saying, so after the COVID-19 um, hit, the government now placed down lockdown rules and these lockdown rules were in five different situations. So the first situation was what they call the, the, the phase five. So no activities and only what they call essential workers were meant to, 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 to go out. So your doctors, your nurses, and um, uh, um, so every other thing was shut down if you were not a policeman and all these other essential workers. So as, as, as now we went out to level five lockdown, the government decided to provide um, 20, 20, um, um, 20 US dollars to all those who have lost their employment and also support businesses that are struggling and also gave food parcels to people who could not, who could not feed their families at that time. But unfortunately at this time, during that time for those foreign nationals who had documentations during that period, I think it's almost eight months now, there were people whose documentations got expired um, uh, and the home affairs could not renew them because they were not open. And so because of that, the, they still had issues of being arrested. You would see um, foreign nationals being targeted because they do not have, um, their documentations have expired. And so you would see 
images like these, uh, the, the, you see lockdown foreign nationals being targeted for expiring documentation. So even though their documentation got expired during the COVID-19 pandemic and the home affairs were not open, they were still being, they were still being arrested for having expired documentation during that time. And so this is during the COVID-19 pandemic. And you would see the officials putting on masks, but then they are still chasing the foreign nationals out of the accommodations that they were having. And so the foreign nationals, where do you go? You don't have a place to stay. And then there is COVID-19, nobody can support you. And then the officials are chasing out those, um, those um, uh, foreign nationals who were living in the middle of the city, like I, I, I showed you at the very beginning. And so that is, now we go now to the health crisis. You see, there are foods that, that is being shared. In the first here, you see this is South Africans who are being encouraged, like I said, the government put out um, um, some, some funds to share food packages for those who are struggling. But these are the foreign nationals who were completely left out from the aid that was being provided for anybody and they are left to fend for themselves. I don't know how or where they should get whatever. These are South African and foreign nationals now that were being left out of the relief grant, nothing for them. And so that's how they pack their things and struggling to go to wherever um, they are going to. Whereas on the right hand side, you would see these are food packages that were being offered to South Africans and for foreign nationals were not being offered anything, whether you're an asylum seeker or whatever situation that you that you had. The same thing occurred with the businesses. So for you to benefit from the business grants, the conditions were that your business must be 100% South African owned. So if you were a foreign national, then you cannot benefit from the grant, even though your business is even employing a lot of South Africans, but because it's not owned 100%. So even if in the board, there are 99, South, uh, even if there are nine South Africans and one foreign national in the board of that business, you will not be given a, a, any benefit. And then at least 70% of the employees must be South Africans and the recipients must be tax compliant. Those three conditions were the conditions for one to be able to access any care um, and, and any support in terms of business. And so you would see um, foreign nationals complaining that they have not eaten for a day or even two or even a week. And so even when it comes to when it comes to payment, the the um, for those who were doing their UFI, their unemployment fund, when you are a foreign national, you get to pay in your 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 unemployment fund insurance fund. But during the COVID nineteen, only those of South Africans were being paid. Those of foreigners were not paid, even though your 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 unemployment fund was being collected when you were working. But now when people who now became unemployed during the COVID-19 period got back this money from the government, foreign nationals were not offered theirs because they are foreign nationals. It doesn't matter even if you had documentation or not, but just being a foreign national excludes you from benefiting from your own um, uh, in, in, in insurance fund. And so that's the story that kept reoccurring and so that's how the situation now got so bad that international organizations now start, had to come and put up houses in this in, in these this um, situation and then they put all these uh, migrants together and in this condition and under the condition of covid 19 where is the social distancing where is where is where, where is the situation to be able to practice any social distancing or to practice anything so these conditions became very very difficult for some um, for were trying to trying to call the government to to action to tell them that this situation is not good. So this is the publication from which the talk is delivered. Thank you so much for the presentation, Ferdinand. Um, before we switch off the the slideshow um, that you, you're sharing, just to reiterate, um, Ferdinand did just uh, publish a paper on the same topic as his presentation today um, in the International Journal for Equity and Health. Um, this is the screenshot of it. Um, so if you have any questions about the article itself or the presentation, of course, drop an email um, to Freddy. Uh, shall we launch into some of the questions and answers? I think we have a couple and I've obviously got several, um, but perhaps we can launch right into that. We have about 15 more minutes left. So um, how does that sound, Freddy? Sounds perfect. Thank you. 
All right. Um, let's start with the questions that have been asked uh, so far. So one of them is from Marlon Garcia, and he asks, uh, racial and social conflicts are indeed not new in South Africa. Do you think xenophobia, and if I can say nationalism, can be seen as a reaction to the rise of globalization? Um, yes, that, that is a very, very good question. Um, but I do not see it as, as the rise of globalization because um, xenophobia in South Africa has a very long history. Um, uh, it's been since the, the new democratic government took over. I think um, as soon as um, uh, Mandela came in, um, that is when um, we now started having um, xenoph xenophobic um, uh, um, occurrences like, like, like we had that, that started becoming violent. And so I think that at that point, the, the thought was that when we were suffering, um, you people stayed away. And then now that things are getting better, um, you people are now coming to rip off or um, benefit from our struggle. Yes, but even though the government has tried to address that in, in, in many ways, that even though you people were suffering, but a lot of other African countries were intervening at the international level, where the population will not be aware of these interventions. But um, uh, it's, um, it's a little bit difficult for the country to get that, uh, or the population to get that at this point. And so um, a lot of um, historians have said that um, these xenophobic attacks are also a reflection or, or a carryover of the of the of, of the apartheid government and the, the way things were handled. Things were handled through strikes and burning down of things and buildings, and so that the, the, there are still relics of that behavior that has now been carried over to the xenophobic um, um, attacks. Yeah. But in a way, and, and I, I can understand how it's basically a historical kind of remnant, as you say. Um, but do you think, I mean, from what you just described, there, it also seems like the government, in a way, by the various acts and laws that are currently in place, continues to, in a way, promote um, that, that historical remnant to continue? Because if you have laws that aren't protecting um, refugees and asylum seekers, then you're not necessarily changing the mindset um, that people had, right? Absolutely, I agree with you. Um, I think um, after the last, I think that was two years ago, the last um, lethal um, and violent xenophobic attacks, um, uh, the government now formed a coalition or a body of inquiry, they claimed to be able to, and, and I think that the goal of that was to educate the population on the importance of having migrants or the or, or the, the the evils of xenophobia, but so far that was just um, uh, I don't know paper talk. Nothing came of the coalition. Nothing. So, but what you see coming up are rather stringent laws against foreign nationals um, uh, that are actually occurring. I think that um, I, I can I can give a very clear example with myself. So. Um, um, in terms of the South African, um, uh, um, where, I, where, where I worked at the South African uh, Medical Research Council, even though I, uh, I, I got accepted, the condition was that I'm being accepted to train a South African to replace me. Because during the interview, a South African, there was no South African at that point who had the qualifications and the experience that I had to do the job. And so when I got the position, they gave me a six months contract. And in my contract, the whole goal was to train a South African to replace me. And so they had to reduce or drop down the qualification criteria for that position of a specialist scientist so that a South African can be able to meet up with the characteristics. And so when they get in, then I was to train them within the six months. And then when my contract expires now, then they replace me in that position. That was a very practical um, uh, demonstration of the xenophobic um, uh, practices that the government has put in place. And the explanation that they gave me at the MRC is that the, 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 that the government has put laws that there is only a certain quota that a government institution can, can, can employ foreigners for. And, I, and I, as I heard, was just 3%. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's also a remnant perhaps of um, 
of, of capacity building, uh, especially in countries like ours, where uh, I'm me being from India, of course, like it's where do you find that balance between developing and building capacity of your own people versus also giving um, opportunity to others who don't have as much and, and we're in that middle ground of being middle income countries. And yeah, it's it's an awkward balance to find, I, I think. Um, moving on to two questions about uh, healthcare. Uh, one of them is, uh, well, they're both from anonymous attendees. Uh, the first is uh, any testing strategy that was broad enough to cover immigrants, uh, so were there for COVID, any testing strategies that was broad enough to cover immigrants uh, and slash or asylum seekers? And the second related question is, what about uh, parallel health systems uh, and providers in, in the provisions of healthcare? Yeah, thank you. That, that, that's actually a very great question. Um, yes, they were, um, they were testing um, protocols that were put in place for, um, for healthcare workers to go and test in the communities right at the beginning when we were in stage, stage five. And, and everybody was encouraged to go and test. However, you were expected to present a documentation to be able to receive a test. Uh, that goes without saying that if you're a foreign national and undocumented, you were excluded. So mm -hmm. that was the situation. The, the, the condition for receiving a test was that you had um, valid documentation. And so, and so even if within that COVID time, if your documents were expired within that time, you would join the queue of those who did not qualify. And so in terms of, par in, in terms of parallel um, uh, health systems, um, there, there isn't. There, there are, of course. You have private um, uh, healthcare providers, but as we all know, they are very pricely. They are very expensive. So that um, if you cannot even access the government's own, that is free of charge. To what extent are you going to be able to access the private healthcare that is even very expensive under COVID nineteen conditions? where you are not even employed, you're even struggling to feed yourself and you're not even given the packages that everybody else is getting. Um, and, and I mean, aside from the private sector, what was, do you think the role of um, the like civil society and multilateral agencies, were they able to provide any forms of um, care that the government or through the public or private system uh, couldn't provide? Yes, I think um, I can think about one. I think Scalabrini. I, I think I mentioned them in 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 in, in the in the publication. But Scalabrini. They they work with foreign nationals and they really stepped up during this time. There are two things that they that they try to implement within this time. First, they are the ones who went to the government and said it is unfair to be arresting these people for documentation expiration on the COVID-19 conditions, and you know that the Home Affairs is not operational. And then when your document becomes um, expired, automatically your bank account gets frozen because the system is meant to accommodate or work in tandem with your documentation. So the day your documentation expires, according to the bank system, your bank account gets frozen immediately. And so how do you access money, even if you had anything in that account when the document did? So the situation is really complex and I could not even really encapsulate it in, 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 in sort of short time, but I'm sure that I, I did a ju justice in the paper, but yeah, so there were a lot of other things. And so Scalabrini came in and tried to do something and wrote to the government and said, this is really unfair. And I think when they were already at level three, then the government now started thinking that, yeah, I think we need to give these people a pass in terms of the documentation so that they are not arrested during this time. However, even though the banks were written and asked not to on not to freeze these accounts, these accounts remained unfrozen. Oh, okay. Yeah. So to go on to one of the next questions, um, which is, did you, did not you, but did the country, did South Africa prepare any contingency plans uh, for these groups of people? I'm guessing the answer is no. Thank you, you've just responded. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I mean, it makes sense, but um, nothing was provided, like you've seen. Even if, if you wanted to make a plan for them, obviously, if you're sharing food packages, you could have just included them, you know. So that that would have actually been much much easier because you just take everybody as a whole. 
it, it, and there was no targeted intervention towards them. In fact, they were sidelined. Like, like, I, like I highlighted, they were actually targeted to be sidelined. Mm. The reason why they're asking for documentation is to sideline them. If not, you will not ask for documentation. The, the, the whole point of asking for documentation is to deliberately sideline them. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost counterintuitive uh, to having contingency plans. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that before COVID-19 itself, that, uh, that uh, undocumented uh, um, migrants and asylum seekers were already going to the IOM uh, to demand to be to be taken back to be sent away anywhere else uh, to anywhere leave else. Africa. And one of the questions that's been written um, by Frederick Sinyinza is that uh, since lockdown started, um, has there been an increase in the number of foreigners wanting to go back to their countries of origin or perhaps anywhere else like the demand to the IOM was? Yes. Um, um, unfortunately, there was no response from the from 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 that office, and and there was a, a, a very big outcry because there was no response. And so the response we actually got is that the the, the police were actually called, like you saw in that photo, to come and um, 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 take them away. And so recently, I um I, I saw just around my neighborhood um, a huge refugee camp was built there, and so they 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 I think that they are all being housed there. So. Uh, remember that during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, when we were still locked in those stringent lockdown, all the borders were also closed. Yeah, so I was saying that, so all of them now are being housed now in these, um, in these camps where they are at the moment. And we are not sure at this point now what the plans are in terms of taking them to another country like they requested or does the government want to do something else? At this point in time, I would imagine that it's not a priority for the government because there are economic issues now that are at play um, in terms of the, 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 the government having to deal with the economic fall down, meltdown um, that has taken because of COVID-19. So I'm not sure that um, when conditions were better, they, their, their priorities were not looked into. I'm not sure that it is now that these priorities will be looked into. Yeah. Um, just to move on to some more questions, because we're getting a, a couple more right towards the end. I think we have four more, and after those four, maybe we can wrap up. Um, the, so one of them is about uh, the coping strategies of immigrants um, and asylum uh, seekers. Um, and yeah, what you know about that. I know you mentioned that in, your, uh, in the paper itself. Um, so perhaps a few words on that. And also a kind of related question, uh, perhaps is that, is there a great probability that migrants are not included within the country statistics of COVID-19? Um, let me repeat the, repeat the second question, please. Is, is there a great probability that the, the, the migrants and asylum seekers are not included, like their COVID status is not included within the country statistics of COVID-19 cases and deaths and whatnot? Of course not. It would not be included. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are not tested, um, like I alluded. And you cannot get statistics on a population that you've not tested. Um, uh, to be tested, you need to come and present a valid documentation. I'm sure um, uh, those foreign nationals who have valid doc documentations like myself, if I, if, I, if I had it, I would have been tested because I would have presented a valid documentation. But now the issue is that the amount, the number of, of foreigners who, who do not have valid documentation is up to about 2 million. And so to leave up to 2 million people not being considered, I think um, that is some research that will be skewed somehow. I think. Speaking of research, one question is, did the research community or academia react to the situation through research projects or other initiatives? Um, uh, not, not that I specifically <laughs> know of, because I know that I'm one of those people who started putting out things out there. And, and, and that's why I'm not surprised why I get a lot of invitations to contribute to these arguments now. But it's not really my field. I think you know that, but it's just a spur of moment thinking that came to me when I was discussing to a foreign national friend. And so just to document their struggle officially, let it be out there in the academic um, environment. But I know that um, uh, there is um, there is this um, uh, research organization that is attached to the um, to to 
the Vitz University, Vitz Vatterston. So they are, I think it is Professor Joveri who is the head of that unit. So they are also working on research um, related issues on foreign nationals and migrants. And so they are also one of the strong advocates to see that the conditions of these people are addressed. And so during that time, I think that there was even some white papers and also some other things that were put out there and sent to the government to help address the situation of the foreign nationals. And they are also um, talking to other organizations that are also doing the same thing in other countries. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, talking um, about talking about coping strategies that I can think of, um, yes, that 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 is very it's 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 very challenging. And in the paper, you would see I mentioned a lot about mental health issues and depression being one of them. I think that it it's it stands to reason that those are the conditions that would prevail in terms of this population at, at this point in time. And so what's the coping mechanism they have? What, what happens is that while foreign nationals are here, they have um, social groups, so to say. So people from a particular country, I also belong to one, um, we, we have social groups where we would meet maybe once a month or something. And so in these social groups, we, come, we, we, we kind of contribute money to help others who are struggling. Yeah. Okay. I, and then I think with mental health concerns, we're just at three o'clock and I'll just take an extra couple of minutes just because of the technical difficulties. Um, with mental health conditions of asylums and migrant seekers, asylum seekers and migrants, um, they, they already oh may be at risk, uh, of course, um, and they may have pre-existing mental health conditions. Um, and then of course, the whole COVID situation probably exacerbates uh, those risks. Um, so that's something to obviously keep uh, in track of as well. We have uh, two last questions. One, why do you think that the Sahel and other sub-Saharan uh, countries, sub-Saharan, yeah, African countries, have lesser numbers of COVID-19 than uh, South Africa? Why do you think that is the case? Quick, yes, um, that is a very interesting question. <laughs> and um, I have been thinking myself why that is happening. And I'm also in a consortium with um, other Cameroonians because I'm originally from Cameroon. And so we always come together every fourth night on Saturdays to reflect on the COVID-19 situation in Cameroon. <laughs> and mm. yeah, in, in, and how we can help. Um, so in, in terms of that, I'm not really sure why it, it, it baffles us. And I tell you what, during the COVID-19 lockdown where every person, every place in the world was locked down, Cameroonian bars and nightclubs were open and running. <laughs> I, yes, I had friends posting pictures that way they are in nightclubs and in bars drinking. And I am like, what the heck? The world is on lockdown. They say that no, Cameroon is not on lockdown. And so I, in spite of that, uh, the, the numbers are still very low. I'm not sure. Um, well, my own hypothesis, this is it. It is not official, but I'm going to still say it. We have been taking, um, uh, they were talking about hydroxychloroquine being something, I don't know. Yes, I know that there's a lot of evidence to say that it does not work or whatever it is. But uh, there's also anecdotal evidence that says it works. We have been taking that medication, hydroxychloroquine, in Cameroon forever because it's a malaria endemic zone. And hydroxychloroquine is used to treat malaria. So my hypothesis, it is not tested. It is my thinking. <laughs> I, I don't know if I agree with you there, Freddie, simply because I'm from India and our COVID cases are not improving. Um, and we also tend to take hydroxychloroquine also from malaria. No, I, don't, I don't know. Okay, maybe we just um, we just have don't have the genes that um, the, 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 the virus is looking for. <laughs> Yeah, perhaps maybe that's the answer. And it, I mean, that's uh, the, the this answer is kind of in line with uh, a question that was asked in French, which is essentially about um, why is COVID nineteen kind of you know wrecking havoc and ravaging so called uh, developed countries, um, whereas the underdeveloped countries are spared. Um, and this is again, um, perhaps we don't know enough right now uh, to be able to say that. But I'm sure there's a lot of hypotheses going around. Um, I think we need to end the session now um, and we can end with one last comment that's been put forward, which was it would be good to have a webinar on this subject. Uh, the, 
generally COVID in sub-Saharan Africa, um, where we can really take these discussions about the disparities um, that, uh, yeah, are abounding across the continent um, to see uh, what hypotheses uh, may, may be real or what we can kind of discern from each country's um, strategy and whatnot. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's actually interesting because you hear um, um, most developed countries are having a second wave, but you don't hear anything from the sub-Saharan countries. In fact, life is just back as usual. Like people, there is no, let, there is no social distancing in Cameroon. There is not. There is no wearing of masks. Those things don't exist. I, I speak with friends and families every day. They don't do those things. Yeah, and I guess yeah. only time will tell. Unfortunately, perhaps. So well, they didn't even have a first. They didn't even have a first, a, 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 a first, um, uh, a first, uh, uh, whatever wave. Yeah. It didn't. Indeed. Wasn't there. So. Um, all right. I think uh, I'm going to thank everyone for the time for having been with us uh, through through the last hour and for also bearing with the um, the small technical glitches. Uh, we have a quick feedback um, session poll uh, that's probably just popped up right in front of your screens. If you could please go ahead and just quickly submit uh, the answers to these two questions, that would be great. Ferdinand, thank you so much for your time, the presentation. Uh, for anyone interested in wanting to know more information or getting in touch with Ferdinand, please do contact him um, in his email. I think that was listed in the invite and the registration. Um, that's my guess. Uh, so thank you everyone for your time. And I think uh, we can close the session.